Um, Sam asked me following um, the last speaker to um, talk about one of my obsessions, which, which is what is good policy. And I come at this, I'm very, very, very big member of the pro-density team, but I don't come at this from the perspective of density for density. My focus, my obsession for the last 30 years has been how do we reduce our energy consumption, how do we reduce our environmental footprint at the same time we contain or control or reduce the rate of increase in our city occupancy costs. So I'm not saying we've got to spend more to, have, to be greener. The question is how do we get greener and, main, and maintain a city that's livable that can house affordably low-income and fixed-income families because that's what a sustainable city is. Shortly before meeting Sam, I was lucky to be part of a consulting team that was hired by the Canadian Ministers of uh, Environment to evaluate 40 different carbon pricing and emissions pricing schemes, direct and indirect carbon taxes, emission taxes, and cap and trade, largely in the United States, and come back and say, is there a good policy here we should be looking at as Canadians? And I have to admit to you, completely wrongly, just before I met Sam, I formed the position that carbon pricing and cap and trade type regulations were the most appropriate, potentially most efficient regulatory policy mechanisms we could introduce to get where we want to go. Um, having said that, I formed that opinion. At the same time, I was looking at the data and saying, okay, right now, 1990-94, um, what is the key determinant of, what, of our energy consumption and our environmental footprint? And at the time, a graph of the cities looked kind of like this. At the time, all European nations, U.S. states were just starting to introduce renewable energy strategies, emission pricing strategies. So I said to Sam, those strategies are really going to make a difference. They're really going to work. But for now, density is the key determinant. Well, Europeans started introducing these carbon pricing strategies in the 1990s, and I thought I'd give it a chance to see how it changes the numbers. Went back, did the graph in about 1998. Looked like this. More carbon pricing strategies in play in the early part of this decade, cap and trade being introduced in many places between 2003, 2005. Go back, do the graph today. This is today's graph. Looks like this. If you actually look at the data, you don't see any, any relationship between energy and carbon pricing and per capita energy demand uh, and emissions. None whatsoever. I've put together a deck of 13 slides. I'm only going to put up a few here. Um, the rest of the slides are not sort of presentations uh, ready, but I want you to know they're there. Email me if you want to see the whole deck to see the justification for my statement that the numbers do not justify the statement that carbon and emissions pricing is good policy. So the question gets to be, what is it about density? And I will show you. Just to make my point, the uh, vertical lines show you the full range of per capita uh, energy demand, household energy demand across Europe over the period 1990 through 2010. The blue dot is the median uh, per capita demand over the period. These, are, this, this, these numbers are normalized to reflect weather changes. And the Red square is where per capita household energy demand is in these nations in 2010. And after all of these years of everybody telling you European-style carbon pricing and, and uh, cap-and-trade regulations will get you to efficiency and lower emissions, the fact is that in every nation on that graph except Germany, the actual per capita energy uh, household energy consumption in 2010 was at or near historical highs. Very interesting story. I'd love to tell you one day behind that graph. When you look back at nationwide, it's not just transportation. If you look at home electricity and heat consumption and take all of the data for 30 years and create a trend, a predicted trend graph for that data, and normalized by density, you see over and over and over again on that graph, the nations that are below the red line 
are less efficient than the norm. The ones that are above the line are more efficient than the norm. And our position on the lines, no matter which nation you're talking about, haven't changed much in 20 years. So my key message here is let's get past I don't know how many hours I spend with clients sitting in a room where we're debating what the right carbon pricing mechanism is and then how to appropriately spend the revenues we get from the carbon pricing mechanism. And we're not talking about what are the attributes this city needs to perform, to complete, to comply with our objectives, and how do we get there. The great thing about saying put a price on carbon is that nobody in the room has to say, and then who does exactly what? I want to spend more time in rooms where we're saying, and who does exactly what? Environmentalists say to me, well, okay, okay, but let's just shift the basis of taxation more and more to consumption, carbon and others, because that's still an efficient tax measure, and we can deal with the environmental issues when we have a more efficient tax measure. What do the numbers also tell you? And these are not my estimates. These are uh, data. This is data you can download from the UK Treasury website. When you shift the basis of taxation from income, to energy consumption, you massively shift the tax burden from the rich to the poor. And in fact, if you actually look at the numbers, one of the principal reasons European nations are having such a difficult time getting out of this recession is because they've massively shift, shifted tax burden from income to energy consumption and value-added consumption. And once you do that, trying to dig out of the hole you built for yourself is really, really, really hard. The UK government was one of the first to introduce uh, energy tax as an environmental measure in 1993. They figured out it was a bad idea. It was costing them more than it was getting them in new revenues. A bunch of reasons we can talk about, I'd love to talk about on another day. They cancelled the fuel tax escalator in 2010 when they realized the fact that, it, that their taxes were taking 2% of the income of the richest and 3.8% of the income. This is after all tax rebates and home heating fuel support is, is accounted for. They committed in 2001 to fix that. We're at, by 2010, situation's worse than it was before. This is very, very hard to fix once you go down the path. In 2001, 2002, uh, the richest families in the UK spent 3.5% of their income on energy taxes. Their disposable income was 10 to 12 times that of the poorest families. After 10 years of trying to fix this, end of 2010, the richest families were spending 2.9% of their income on energy taxes, and their disposable income had increased to 14 to 16 times that of the poorest families. Why does this matter to you as a city? We have to house the poorest families. We can't afford this tax shift. I'm totally for regulatory measures to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gases. We cannot afford this tax shift. I, maybe I, just in passing, look at the distribution of burden for value-added tax. These are UK numbers. They're almost identical to BC's. We had a lot of very, very stellar economists argue that the PST to HST tax shift was a good idea because the PST is a bad tax. Totally agree. PST is a stupid tax. But none of the analysis arguing in favor of the HST asked the second question. When we give up the, a the PST and the revenues from the PST, what is the best tax to replace it? HST, value-added tax, very bad idea massive shift of tax burden from the rich to the poor. I think, because we're running out of time, I want to I wanna say my key message is we've got to stop going into meetings saying, what's, how do we, what's the best way to put the price on carbon? And how are we going to spend the revenues? All of the data from the other nations say that when you start to have to mitigate the impact of carbon pricing on the poor, you end up having less revenues and nothing to spend. When you go back past that debate, you also need to get into the weeds and say, how do we make things work? You can set aside, I'm pro-density, you can set aside the argument for density and say, what are the attributes of density that we are trying to see realized here, and how do we make them work? And I'll just give you one cautionary tale. If you look at cities worldwide, at models you want to replicate, I would be the first to agree 
getting district heating happening in the community is a top, top priority. But the other thing that you need to pay attention to is if you look at two cities with virtually identical populations, virtually identical po politics, virtually identical opportunities to launch district heating, identical demand, identical heat supplies, if City A decides that the reason they want to go into district heating is because they want to create a new municipal revenue stream so they can use the revenues from district heat to hold down property taxes, i.e. they're looking to exploit the increasing cost of electricity to create profits from district heat, inevitably the district heating system that that city develops loses money year after year and bleeds the municipal tax base. If you're a city team that is saying everything we're going to do, including district heat, is about minimizing residents occupancy costs, you will build a highly profitable, successful district heating system. It's about how you do it. We have to get to the point where we're sitting there and saying, how are we doing it? What are we trying to achieve? And what you're trying to achieve is lower energy consumption at lower occupancy costs. And when you focus on that, the world of opportunities is enormous. And when you don't focus on that, you'll do two or three projects and lose all of the support of your rate base to do any more. So I think I'll stop there.